You probably noticed as we were chanting about the factors of the path that right view comes first. But you also have to remember that in the Buddha's own quest for awakening, right view came after. But he talks about getting on the path. Right concentration came first. After having tried different ways were not the path, he did learn some lessons from those ways. He learned one big lesson about sensuality. That if you're going to train the mind, you have to get it past its fascination with sensual thoughts. And this is a deep-rooted tendency we have. When we're looking for a little pleasure, we think about sights, sounds, smells, tastes, tactile sensations, thoughts of lust. We get really fascinated about these things. The mind leans in that direction whenever it has free time. That's the direction it goes when it's untrained. We're trying to train it in another direction so that its default mode is going back to the breath. And it does require that you see the danger in sensuality. So the Buddha realized, after totally denying himself all kinds of pleasure, he realized that the, the pleasure of right concentration was not going to be dangerous. That's how he got on the right path. And he was feeling his way toward right view. He may have had a general idea, but the specifics took time. And it's going to be the same for us. Who gives that analogy of the practice being like the continental shelf off of India? There's a gradual slope and then a sudden drop. But it's not like the gradual slope is totally without obstacles. And in some cases, your gradual slope is going to be different from his. To give another analogy, when you hear about right view, you get the basic outline. It's like trying to find your way through New York City when you're told that some of the avenues tend north and south and the streets tend east and west. But the question is, which street, which avenue? Where do you turn? Where do you not turn? You find that out by exploring. And it's the same way with the meditation. We get a general idea of right view. And we try to get the mind into right concentration so we can learn more details. For example, right view tells us that the cause of suffering is craving, three kinds of craving, for sensuality, becoming, not becoming. Where are we going to learn our lessons about those things as we try to get the mind into concentration? You know, this is where we learned the specifics. A while back I was asked if it's okay to know just general principles that anger is a bad thing, sensuality is a bad thing. I said, of course not. You've got to know the specifics, because that's where the allure lies. It's not the case that sensuality in general attracts you. There are specific sensual pleasures that the mind tends to go for, and you've got to know where they go, where the mind goes, where those pleasures are. Because that's where you're going to see your cravings. As the Buddha said, you've got to see where is your craving focused. It's not focused on sensuality in general or anger in general. Specific issues have their specific strips of Velcro. And if you're going to shave off the Velcro, you first got to find out where it is. So as you try to get the mind to settle down, you're going to run into distractions. Some of the distractions come from events outside. But the main ones are the ones that come from the mind itself. You're sitting here very quietly, very still. You may be bothered by the fact there are other people in the room, but you learn how to put that aside. Years back we had someone who had spent most of his life as a meditator in hermetically sealed environments, came to the monastery, was meditating out in the orchard, and complained about all the noise. I asked him, what noise? So, well, the noise of the bugs going through the leaves, the noise of the wind going through the trees. You have to ask yourself, why do you let that bother you? Now, your 
problems may not be the same as his, but we have our specific problems. And getting the mind to settle down, you're going to have to run past those problems. Sensuality will be the big one. Seeing exactly where your sensual cravings are focused. Becoming is also another one, because as you begin to notice that when you leave the breath, you go into another thought world. And it's as if the breath doesn't exist and the body doesn't exist. You're entirely someplace else. Well, how did that happen? And what part of the mind wanted it to happen? You're not going to see the specifics until you try to get the mind still, until you fight the process of wandering off. You have to get really good at noticing when you've wandered off and you can drop the thought, pull out of that world as quickly as you can. Some of those worlds are really attractive, others are just kind of random. But the question is, why does the mind go for them? You've got to see that specifically. And then the really subtle one, seeing that craving for non-becoming, in other words, to destroy those thought worlds, that's going to create suffering too. There's stress there as well. In other words, if you wait for the process of becoming to be fully formed, it is painful to get out. Even if you don't like that particular world, it takes a lot of struggle to get out of a particular world of thought. And you begin to realize that if you want to get out of the process entirely, if you want to freedom from the process entirely, you've got to take another tack. You can't just shoot down the thought worlds that have already arisen. You've got to figure out why do they arise to, in the first place? What underlies them? This is why the Buddha teaches us about dependent core rising, because we have to look into those factors that come prior to craving if we want to understand how to stop the process before the state of becoming forms. There's a passage in the canon where the Buddha talks about Venerable Sariputta's amazing ability to analyze his concentration while he was in it. Very precise. Seeing the different factors in the mind that go into getting the mind focused on a certain perception and a certain feeling, and then in trying to maintain that perception, re repeat it again and again and again, and repeat that feeling again and again. And a lot of the factors around that are the factors of name and name and form. So you're sitting here in the form of the body. The breath is form. There's going to be attention to your topic, your intention to stay, your perception that holds you here, the feeling of pleasure that you're trying to maintain, or the feeling of equanimity if you get deeper into concentration, and then contact among these mental events, so they will work together. The thing is, when you can see these things clearly, now you may not be able to see them all clearly in the same way that Venerable Sariputta did, but they're right here, they're happening here, and when we get the mind into concentration, we're dealing on the level of these things. You see your intentions in action, you see your perceptions in action. You're focused directly on the feeling and the perception. And your attention and intention are right there. So we get the mind quiet, and you can see these things a lot more clearly. And when you can learn how to develop some dispassion for them, that's when you can undercut the whole process of craving that would go for sensuality, or for becoming, or for non-becoming. So it's in doing the concentration, starting with right effort through mind mindfulness into right concentration, that you get to see the specifics here of craving. And that way right view gets developed. So it's not just a general idea that you can talk about. But you actually see it in action, that yes, these movements of the mind for sensuality, becoming and non-becoming, really do create suffering. It may not be blatant suffering, it may just qualify as stress, but it's the same sort of thing. 
and in becoming specific. That's how right effect, <coughs> how right view becomes effective. Because you've learned actually where are the the valleys and the canyons in your continental shelf. So when the shelf drops away, you're there. You've made it there. Or to take on the analogy of finding some place in Manhattan, you know which street, which avenue. You know where you are, you know where the, the target is, the location you're trying to go. Because you've gotten there, you did the exploration that was needed. So it's here in getting the mind to settle down and to be really good at keeping it here that you're going to see these things. We have this tendency to want to squeeze things and get fast results. But when you're squeezing things, you're not really attentive. You're not really clearly seeing what's going on. All you can see is where you want to go, or your preconceived notion of where you want to go. But it may turn out, in terms of that slope off of the coast of India, there may be a canyon in between where you are where you want to go. There may be weird animals on the, the floor of the ocean as you're going to work around. But they're all worth knowing about, because it's in the specifics that right view becomes the genuine part of the path. We can know about it in general terms, but that doesn't put us on the noble path yet. It puts us on a path in the general direction. But we have a specific goal, and that's going to require watching very carefully where you're going, where you are. When you stay right here, the things that you need to know will come right here, because they already are right here. It's just that you have to be still enough to allow them to show themselves. The image they give in Thailand is of being a hunter. If the hunter makes a lot of noise, moves around, tries to get here, tries to get there, the animals all run away. The hunter wants the animals to come to him. He has to be very still. 